thanks to Bryn Mawr for hosting this conference. It's really been a great experience for me. I've been learning a lot here as well. And I thank all of you for sticking around for the very last presentation <laughs> of the day. Um, so I was inspired to blend um, my introductory physics lab based on going to a conference a couple of years ago that was about um, teaching physics laboratories beyond the first year. And I, I went to a talk about um, flipping the pre-lab for um, a, a uh, more intermediate lab course. And I thought, hmm, that's a really intriguing idea. How might I modify this for um, an introductory physics course that, that I'm teaching? So I would like to talk to you guys today about um, some of the changes that I made. Because like Monica, this was the second time that I was teaching this course, so I had um, a base to start from. And so how I, how I tweaked thinking about my course goals and how potentially flipping the pre-lab would um, lead to better learning outcomes for, for my students. Um, but first, let me tell you a little bit about the course. Um, this is uh, a, the, it's actually the third of three in our introductory physics sequence. So at um, Denison, we, um, we break up our intro courses into, uh, into three. So this actually occurs in the fall of their sophomore year, most typically, for these students. Um, the content, we do a lot of really fun stuff. We talk about electricity, magnetism, waves, and optics. Um, and we meet four days a week in, for class time, and then we have a three-hour lab each week. Um, before I um, incorporated the blended learning, um, what we would do, be what I would have the students do prior to lab was a pretty traditional um, pre-lab activity. So where students would do some reading, typically you know, related textbook um, materials and their um, lab manual to see what was this week's lab going to be about um, and just kind of get some background content knowledge as well as a little bit of an idea of um, you know, experimentally what would we be doing in the lab, and then they would do a pre-lab worksheet. So within the lab manual itself, you know, turn, work on maybe doing a derivation or writing some definition. So just having a, some exposure to some of those concepts or ideas or some of the data analysis methods we might be doing um, to just get them a little bit primed. But they would turn, they would come to the beginning of lab, turn in the worksheet to me, and I wouldn't be able to see their responses until after the lab. So I didn't really have a way of knowing, you know, what difficulties they were having prior to coming to, to lab. Um, then I would give, at the beginning of lab, my you know, typical kind of pre-lab quote lecture, um, where we talk a little bit about what are the concepts that are relevant, link it back to class, um, introduce them to the equipment, show them through some, some demonstration of how to interact with that um, apparatus, and some expectations for here's how we can analyze the data, what are you going to be putting in your lab report um, for, that, for that week. Um, in the lab itself, so of course, pretty typical for lab, right? So you're set it, the students are setting up the equipment, collecting data, analyzing, interpreting, drawing conclusions. And then at the end, they either have a lab notebook that they would turn in. And this was a couple of days later, right? They have a couple of days to complete their lab report and hand it in to me to be graded. Or they would do a lab quiz that would sometimes be at the end of the lab or sometimes be um, at the beginning of, say, the next week's lab. But the one issue with um, doing the pre-lab the way that it was before was that um, this, the very first sort of um, bullet point here, so the setup equipment, collect data, that has to happen in the lab, right? You're not, you can't do that outside of lab. Um, but depending on how much time it took within the lab itself to do the setup, and some of the labs are more labor intensive in terms of how much time it takes to collect the data, more of the analysis, the interpreting the data, some of this more challenging um, thinking would have to go on outside of the lab. And so the students wouldn't have as immediate access to the instructor within the lab to, to work on these pieces. Um, they'd be you know, having to work on them outside of lab. And of course, they could come talk to me in office hours or outside. But it just made it much more challenging for them to, to do so. Um, so my thought was, well, if we it, I tried to do some of that pre-lab activity before they came to lab and, and get some, them some more automatic feedback of here are some things that I might not be understanding and also give me some more feedback of, to see where the students' misconceptions were. Um, we, could, we could jump into more of this, you know, getting into collecting the data um, earlier on and so that we could hopefully um, spend some more time in the lab itself on some of these, more, these important things like analyzing, interpreting data. Um, and, and whatnot. Um, another thing at this conference that um, I, I took away from was um, 
some recommendations that this, so AAPT is American Association of Physics Teachers, and there was a subcommittee group that um, came up with recommendations for the undergraduate physics laboratory curriculum. And um, so, and, and a lot of these, so, um, so Mei Chang talked in um, her um, session earlier today on <coughs> peer review about some of the um, uh, learning goals that she had for her students in the advanced lab. And these are applicable to labs at all levels. Um, but really, it's all about constructing knowledge um, from an experimental approach, right? But, and so and the, the goals for advanced students are different than the introductory students that I was working with. Um, so I was thinking about you know, which parts of, of all of these um, goals are sort of important for um, the students at the introductory level. And if you think about, if I was thinking about it, I could break it down into two, two basic areas. Um, so, so reinforcing or developing content knowledge um, and um, basically lab skills. Right? So it's sort of the, the lab skills um, aspect that I was trying to get more at by, um, by doing some more of the content building prior to the lab. Um, but so for Physics 127, you know, we're, trying to, we're trying to use experiments to help them build, construct knowledge, to be able to draw conclusions. Um, but developing the technical and practical skills, if we don't have a lot of time where they can interact with the equipment or really understand, instead of just telling them to use it or, or how to use it, how does it work? Um, you know, can you understand what this device is telling you or understand its limitations, um, things like that. So, um, so spending some time developing those technical and practical skills. Of course, analyzing and visualizing the data that you get. So creating the graphs. Can you interpret the graphs appropriately? Um, and, and especially in my mind, modeling is really important for, you know, physics, for physical science. We, you know, for thinking about what modeling is. So in physics, we often have, so, this mathematical model. Here's an equation right, that we're trying to test, and we get data from doing an experiment and seeing how well our experiment fits our model. Right? And so um, being able to understand your, ex your equipment, your experiment, um, really helps you understand where does, it di where does it diverge from your model, what simplifications are you making. And so that really takes some really deep understanding. And at the introductory level, it's hard to get to that. Um, but this Physics 127, since it's in the fall of their sophomore year, they've already had two um, introductory lab courses in the physics department where they've been able to build up some of these skills um, to some level, where now is the chance for me to springboard them into our advanced labs. So we have two, we have, we have an uh, uh, experimental physics, an upper level lab, and an advanced electronics lab that really, and I want to make sure that they're prepared for those where they're not just drowning when they get to those, um, those more advanced, advanced courses. And there's some designing experiments in this. Um, we, we don't do as much where the students are designing the experiments themselves, but it's sort of getting them primed for that, for when they, they get to that point. Um, in the upper level labs. So, so here's what I, the approach that I took. I really incorporated um, so two main components. Um, I created a couple, I created some short pre-lab videos for um, the labs that we were doing. And I'll talk to you all a little bit more about um, some formats that those took. It took a variety of different formats. You can kind of see here two examples where um, one I'm showing an apparatus, another one I'm talking about um, some different analysis expectations I have for them. Um, and the other were um, online pre-lab quizzes. So at Denison, we use our um, LMS is Noteball. We just switched this past year. So um, one nice thing about Noteball, I don't know if anyone here knows Noteball or has used <coughs> Noteball. Um, so one nice thing about Noteball is that um, Denison has a relationship with, with that LMS where they can take faculty input and suggestions and actually modify or change the things that Noteball can do for you. Um, there are some downfalls to Nopal, which I'll, I'll talk about in, in a moment, and it's very specific to me. Um, but so, so developing these online pre-lab quizzes um, to get them ready for, for the lab. So things that I thought might happen, they did happen, um, that students did come to lab more prepared. Um, and it gave, and like I said, it, I was more prepared as well because I could go in and see which, which questions on the pre-lab quiz did they really struggle with so that I could um, address those prior to the lab itself. Um, and it would enable me to, so with some of the um, just-in-time type teaching that could go on. And then I, I asked them to come to the board often at the beginning of the lab instead of me to talk about you know, the lab, what was going on that day. Oftentimes I would have them come up in groups and I would you know, say, okay, you guys do this derivation that you had to do for the pre-lab and, and 
talk about it with, with the group or, or have them talk about a certain aspect of, of the experiment. So, um, and, and since they knew, they anticipated that they would be asked to do that, it gave them even more accountability where they, they could show up and say, okay, I know that, that we might have to do this, so, um, um, so I can get myself ready to understand really what's going on with the lab. Um, and it did allow some more time to do analysis, <coughs> develop their lab skills. And there were some labs where um, we had some extra time at the end that I anticipated that would open up some different lab extensions where I could ask them to do, you know, take the lab one step for further, measure something different, modify something slightly about the experiment, and um, let them go into a little bit more, more depth. Um, so I just have a couple of, of um, snippets of what some of these videos are like. I, don't have any sound, I just took a couple of little clips, but so as I mentioned, so some of them, um, I would show them a little bit about what the apparatus was, so they'd be prepared, they'd know what it was, would look like when they would come in. Um, some of them, it was me literally just standing in front of, this is the um, whiteboard in my office, um, taking them through um, some of the concepts, ideas, a derivation before we, um, so that they needed to know how to do what sort of the model was for, for the lab. Um, Others, I did um, some screen casting, and this one I spread, I did not go this fast in the, in the video itself, but sped it up for people to see. Um, so showing some theory behind what's going on, also a little bit about how they're gonna be analyzing their, their data. So I tried a couple of different types of, of videos. Um, and when I was developing these, I, I tried to do a little bit of background research to figure out you know, what kinds of things, have people done research to, you know, think about um, what kinds of things to think about when you're creating videos for, say, a flipped classroom. And I found a blog post by, um, uh, by Chris Graybow, and it referenced a study by um, Guo and Rubin from 2014 about recommendations on how to create videos to encourage student engagement. Because for me, I was thinking about, well, should I be in the video or not? And I heard, you know, various things. So I'm thinking to myself, should I be in there or not? Part of me is like, I don't really want to see myself teaching and, and all that. Um, as you see from my videos, I took a variety of approaches. Um, but what they um, had found in this study was, um, was that the idea of doing sort of a screencast of the screen and having the instructor's head at the bottom was the quote mo more engaging. Um, I don't think there's been a ton of research on, on this yet, but so it, as you saw, I didn't always do that approach. Um, the length they found, you know, for something like this, watching offline, they found shorter to be more engaging. Keeping around six minutes was a good amount of time. So if, for example, it doesn't mean that six minutes total for anything, but sort of six minute segments where um, maybe you'd have uh, several videos that are shorter in length or a longer video where you break it up with saying, okay, here's one of the pre-lab questions. Now go think about, do this one, and then come back kind of thing. So breaking it up for, um, for the students. This, the, the comment about quality I found really reassuring because they found that personal, was more important than something with high production value. It was like, I can do that. I don't know, I'm not so confident I can make some you know, really crazy high quality uh, video, but, but I can make it personal and fun. Um, screen capture, the screen casting um, workshop yesterday was really great. I learned lots of wonderful things in there because this was, I knew very new to this, so um, I was talking to people in um, my educational technology services and others on campus who had done some screen capture. And what I used and I found extremely easy to use was Screencast-O-Matic. Another benefit is that it's free. Um, so they're, they're, they have a, a version you can pay for where you get sort of more bells and whistles. Um, but Screencast-O-Matic was perfect for me. There are some other options that, um, like I said, in the screencasting workshop, um, found out a lot more about other things, um, but other options out there to use that I'm sure people are familiar with as well. Um, the pre-lab quizzes, like I said, I used our LMS um, notebook. And I used a mixture of different types of questions, multiple choice, free response. Um, I chose a variety of different content, some questions based on you know, the physical principles, the conceptual information, um, some things about the experiment, um, some things about the analysis method. I might ask a question like, what do you think might be the largest source of uncertainty? Just try and get them thinking a little bit about, you know, if, if I'm actually in there doing this experiment, what kinds of things might be going on? I made them do the evening before the lab um, to give them time to sort of sleep on it and for me to get up the next morning and, and look at what they had done. And I'd occasionally have them turn something in offline, um, like some of the um, uh, more mathematical derivation type pieces. 
Um, so some the pros, like I said, automatic feedback. I could view their grades by question. So if, for example, you know, on this particular PLEB quiz, the average grade was zero out of two on question two, that's a big red flag. And I go, okay, we're going to talk about that question when we go in to lab tomorrow. Um, but one of the, the biggest cons for me, so since there were no Noble users, this is, um, you know, but there's no equation editor, so this, this is something that we have been talking to the Noble people about, you know, trying to get LaTeX incorporated in there. So that was that was a challenge for me um, in something that's very mathematical, not having an uh, equation ed editor in there. But it could upload uh, figures and, and things like that. So sort of there's a little bit of a workaround, but it's a little clunky for that reason. Um, so what, another thing I wanted to share with with you all is a bit about assessment. So I assessed this in, in a few ways. But basically, you know, I got some just general feedback from the students by asking them questions about, um, about the, the flipped pre-lab. And um, so some of the positive things, this, this first one was not exactly a positive. I took it as a positive because <laughs> I was like, I don't mind. Um, like, neutral is positive. So, but mostly they were things like, um, uh, I walk in with a sense of what I'm about to do. I did feel like I was more prepared. It was helpful to have already engaged with these questions. Um, most of, there were, there were some, a few negatives that were mostly things that I can address very easily. Things like um, they didn't like it that they had to have it due on the night before instead of, say, maybe the morning of. Um, and they wished that they had a little bit more time to engage with them. So that's something that this next time going around having done it once, I can, I can easily change. Um, another way I assessed it was with something um, called the E-Class survey. This is, um, this is something that um, at the University of Colorado, um, Ben Zwickel and Heather Lewandowski developed this um, survey. It's for um, learning attitudes about science for experimental physics. But it basically asks students, surveys them questions about what they think about when they do an experiment and what they think experts think about. And so this is a, a um, survey that you can give to them pre and post the course and, and see whether or not their attitudes change. Um, so I wanted to share a couple of results with you all. If you look, so the red is my course, gray is similar courses. Um, there was not, there's not a significant change. It went from, for this um, overall, one is they think like experts. <laughs> so um, 0.78 to 0.79, so not a huge change. But I picked out a couple of um, uh, questions to specifically look at. Um, so things like, and this, this first one I was like, oh, that's horrible. I don't enjoy doing physics experiments. They're, they're, they go, are going from some high number to an even larger number. But this is thinking like experts. So that looked alarming at first. But it just means that they're, they're, thinking, they're thinking more like experts. So I guess that means they do enjoy doing physics experiments. Um, they, designing and building things is an important part of doing physics experiments. There was positive movement on that. Um, things like my first my first thing to do is to ask an instructor. They were already pretty high on thinking like an expert on that one. Not everything was good. So this one, a common approach for fixing a problem with an experiment is to randomly change things until the problem goes away. No, don't do that, you guys. Um, so this, there was a little bit, and we're like, oh no, that's not good. Um, but, but a lot of this movement, it's not, um, it's not a, a huge margin. I also didn't have a huge number of students in the class. Um, I don't have to talk about all of these, um, but so I was thinking a little bit about how these questions fit into the overall learning goals as well. And this one was, uh, the question was, how important for earning a good grade in this class was? So this to me meant, how did my instructor value these things? And so going back to the randomly changing things, at least they knew that it was not important for their grade because they rated it as very low, um, the randomly fixing things. To, but generally, there were, some, there were some good things about you know, um, understanding how the experimental setup works. That was very important for them and compared to other courses as well. Um, um, things like choosing an appropriate method for analyzing the data without explicit instruction of really high importance for, for their grade. So, so it was a good sign to me that they were understanding that, you know, what things are valuable um, in this course. So I, have, I had on here um, a couple of things about just comparing them to um, other, the other courses. M you would know, all of the, my students were physics students. Um, they all had a really high interest in physics. Um, they all, there were many that are interested in physics graduate schools, so it could explain some of that, you know, difference between them and other courses that they're, they're pretty invested. They're physics majors and they're, 
um, very interested. This is my last slide. I have to throw it up here. This is the quantitative <laughs> session. So of course I had to get a little nerdy about um, trying to look at my course when I blended it versus, versus not. And the thing, I will point out one thing. And of course, this all has to be taken with a grain of salt because I had, I had 12 students in each of these courses, so it's a low number of students. Um, the one thing that I noticed um, that stuck out to me was that um, we do at the end of the year a, a, a lab practical final exam where the students come in and they're given basically a task, can you measure this thing, here's some equipment, and then they do it on their own. And, um, and, I, and we do it in other courses as well, and there's generally there's there's always some that kind of bomb the lab practical. Um, and I looked, I wanted, and this happened way after the end of the semester, it dawned on me that um, their performance on the lab practical in 2017 when I blended it was, was really great compared to um, in 2015. And I thought that's really just very interesting that you know when they sat, they actually sat down with the equipment in that high anxiety, high stress situation that you know none of them really had that that bombing kind of moment, um, and overall the average was a little better. So in conclusion, I, you know, just it led to the blending led to a greater student instructor presentation, more time in class for lab skills. Overall, it's, I saw a great um, positive outcome. So um, I thank you very much <laughs> for your time. <laughs>